Reporting from the World War II Museum in New Orleans, Louisiana, here's Bob Lee. According to author Gary Bettingfield, over 4,000 minor league players were drafted into service and 135 of those men were killed in the service of their country. ESPN baseball analyst Kurt Schilling is a member of the Board of Trustees of this National World War II Museum here in New Orleans, and he joins us today. Kurt, it's good to have you with us. We have so much to talk about, about the brave men and women and, and your perspective on this, but let me first give to you as an athlete. So we've just talked about baseball and the sacrifice of the national pastime. Here you had athletes in their absolute prime, MVP such as Hank Greenberg in 1940, the 41 accomplishments of DiMaggio and Ted Williams, and men at their prime immediately going into the service of their country. As an athlete, your perspective 50 years on. I, I can't imagine it. I, I had the honor and the privilege of talking with many members of, of baseball that served in the Second World War, and I had kind of a, a front row seat. I, I, I can remember having multiple conversations with Johnny Pesky about, uh, he loved to talk about Ted. He, Johnny and Ted were, were the best of friends. They were like brothers, and he talked about everything from them, you know, enlisting to their basic training to to going through the war and then after the war, how, taught, how Ted had talked about uh, you know, his service. And anytime you talk to Mr. Williams, that was one of the things, he always mentions that as the thing he's most proud of is the fact that he was a, a Marine fighter pilot. Yeah, not only in World War II, but also lost several more years of his career in the service of the country in Korea. Let's talk about this museum. You're a member of the Board of Trustees. How did you become involved? Uh, I was lucky. I really was. I, I grew up in a military family, so uh, I've always had a profound uh, respect and love for, for all things uh, of our armed forces and the people in it. And uh, through roundabout conversations, I think they found out I was very interested in what they were doing. Um, World War II has always been a passion of mine. Um, and, and word got down there, and they actually sent me an invitation to ask me to serve on the board, and I couldn't accept quick enough because it's something I I'm just so have such a strong belief in the preservation of this incredible time in the history of this country and the incredible people. And, and when you go around down there, as you're getting to see the, uh, the items and the stories and the live accounts, um, all of that is just incredibly powerful. It's a message that, that needs to never be lost. You've also had the opportunity, I know you're involved with several members of the Band of Brothers, memorialized, of course, the HBO series, the Stephen Ambrose novel. Your dad was a member of the 101st in later years. And so you, you've actually sat with members of Easy Company and shared some, some thoughts and conversations with them. I have. I've had the honor and privilege of having these incredible men in my home. My wife and I had a, a, a fundraiser for a project. They're trying to do a follow-up movie. Um, what an incredible, you know, the hard part for me is that, that um, these men came into my home and they were in, uh, there was a certain amount of awe and respect that they were showing towards me and I could not have felt more uncomfortable with that because I felt like I had like these iconic American heroes and that is exactly how I feel about them. Um, so there's a, a, a somewhat of a mutual respect, although it was very uncomfortable for me to listen to these men or, or have these men be somewhat, um, timid as I guess two guys from Philadelphia and <laughs> Babe Heffron and Bill Garnier who who I think in real life are anything but timid um, but it was what an incredible experience it was to sit there and hear them tell their stories and, and talk about life before and after the war and they were commanded and if you're familiar with the series at home you, you've seen uh, the portrayal of lieutenant and eventually major Dick Winters and there's an effort underway currently to erect in Normandy a statue to Lieutenant Dick Winters of, of Easy Company uh, to basically what represent all the men in his position, lower echelon officers who led by, by design and, and by, by chance on occasion on that, that fateful day. Well, when you look at, uh, if you've had the pleasure and the fortune of watching Band of Brothers, when you look at um, Easy Company and Major Winters, uh, his career in the military from basic training to the, to the assault at Brer Court Manor, all the way through the war, the end of the war, um, I looked at that and I, I, there was a lot of parallels in a very different way to the sports world and you realize that, that great leaders are, are born uh, and not made and he was someone whose life, you, all of the interviews around the, uh, his life, the story of the Easy Company, all the things they talked about, they talk about him with a reverence and, and there's a lot of terminology that I hear in baseball, you know, you hear players say I'd run into the wall for this guy, I'd run through a wall for this guy um, and then you hear players or, or soldiers talk about serving for for major winners uh, you know and they have to say things like I, I would have taken a bullet for him and you realize that there's such a marked difference 
in the use of the word hero and warrior and all the things that we tend to throw around very comfortably today about athletes that truly don't apply. You actually in the museum here hear his account of the drop on the morning of D-Day. They, they landed behind the lines before the troops hit the beach at Omaha and Juneau and Sword and all, all the other beaches. And in his own words you hear, of course in war so many things go wrong, but by the time he landed he lost all his equipment. He landed in Normandy with just his knife. Yeah, and a compass, and uh, and he still led his men. And like I said, I, 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 the stories that these gentlemen were telling in my home that night about him, and they t they told the, the stories that I I love to hear the behind the scenes stuff. It's just fascinating stuff. Kurt, you've got a fundraising event for the Major Winters statue. It is where Providence on Friday evening. Tell me about it. Yeah, it is. It's it's another chance for us to get out. Uh, for me to be in the company in the presence of these incredible people and their families, but, but also for that story to be told again. The major winner story, Easy Company story, really the, the story of that entire generation, because these men, while, while we've marked them as unique and different because of, the, of their military service, they weren't that, that different than the entire generation. This was, um, you know, we talked about it earlier, you've got uh, hundreds of big league ball players, thousands of minor league ball players who did this, who served and, and were killed in the line, and, and when you look at I know having the story told to my kids or talking with my kids about it, it's a huge deal but but in our generation we had Pat Tillman and we've had some other ones but Pat Tillman's story was um, a phenomenon and and while obviously you're incredibly proud of the fact that he did what he did and it's a tragic story there were hundreds and thousands of people in his position in the 1940s that did this thing without blinking an eye at 17 18 19 years old and it's an incredible powerful message and that those two messages I think kind of I think say something about the separation in our generations and it's a story that needs to continue to be told. Well the greatest generation is memorialized here in New Orleans. Kurt it's uh, good of you to share part of your Sunday morning with us. We appreciate it. Thanks Bob.